In this lecture, we're going to talk about protists. So probably something we don't know a whole lot about yet, or really anything about. So our essential questions, we'll kind of have two, and they'll be along those same lines as what we had with prokaryotes. So what are protists? That's the big thing. We just want to figure out what these little guys are. And how are they classified? There we go. That's what we're trying to figure out here. So first of all, protists, just so we know who we're talking about, these are an extremely diverse collection of unicellular eukaryotes. So that's about the main thing that they have in common, is that they are one cell and they're eukaryotes. So remember, these are cells that have a nucleus. So that's the, the big thing here. Okay. They may constitute multiple kingdoms within eukarya. We, they used to kind of be kingdom protista, uh, but it refers to eukaryotes that aren't plants, animals, and fungi. So really, it's just kind of the miscellaneous category. It's like, well, it's not a plant, it's not an animal, it's not fungi. I don't know what it is, call it a protist. <laughs> so it's kind of a grab bag of just miscellaneous things that didn't fit into any of these categories. Okay, so protists obtain their nutrients in many ways. So just like we saw with the diversity of uh, prokaryotes, these guys are kind of a diverse eukaryote. So first of all, we've got autotrophs or self-nourishers like algae, and they make food by photosynthesis. We have heterotrophs, so different nourishments like protozoans, and they'll eat some things. We also had some heterotrophs like parasites. Um, they'll get nutrition from living off a host. And then we have mixotrophs, which actually can utilize photosynthesis and heterotrophy. So they can eat and they can photosynthesize, which is pretty, pretty interesting. So here's an alga that does um, some photosynthesis. Here's Giardia. It's a parasite. And then Euglena is a mixotroph, so it tends, it can do both. Okay. Protists are found in lots of habitats, including really anywhere that there's moisture. So anywhere you find like a pond or a lake or anything like that, probably even in our sink. In fact, I'm sure if we ran water out of there, we'd get some protists. We also find them in the bodies of host organisms. So we're going to find them all over the place. All right, there's a little, little scanning electron micrograph and a transmission electron micrograph of a uh, little Giardia. Recent molecular and cellular studies indicate that nutritional modes used to categorize protists do not reflect natural clades. So really how their phylogeny, so their kind of relationship, their evolutionary relationship isn't really clear. We have no idea how these guys fit together. So if you're into that kind of thing of taxonomy and figuring out how things are related is kind of something you're into, protists are going to be great for that because we're still figuring that out. So. Little, little job security in that. One hypothesis, though, is that we're going to um, have four monophyletic supergroups. It used to be five, so a, a tendency of mine is to think of alveolata and rhizaria as different ones, uh, but we're going to call it the SAR, uh, Straminopilla, alveolata, and rhizaria, and they're all going to be one supergroup together. We have excavata, we have unicons, and archaeplastida. So these are going to be our, our four major groups that we can classify these strange guys as. One thing before we kind of get started into that classification is talking about the connection to um, looking at some diversity. So the endosymbiont theory explains the origin of mitochondrion chlor chloroplast, which is pretty cool. So according to the theory, oxygen-using prokaryotes establish residence within one larger prokaryote. So essentially, it's like you have a eukaryote, and it essentially ate a prokaryote. It's a think like, I know it's coming out wrong, but it's going to look sort of like a, I got Pac-Man situation over here. But what then happened is that that piece incorporated into the host and now it's just there. So that's really the endosymbiont theory is that at some point this guy kind of like ate um, like a prokaryote and then it just kind of became a part 
of the pro or the eukaryote in general. So endosymbionts involved in the mitochondria giving rise to heterotrophic eukaryotes. So that's a really cool one. We'll leave it kind of at that. Um, we can talk about it a little bit later. But let's start with our SIR supergroup. So this is going to be group one that we talk about. So this one gets a little bit muddier than it does with the uh, eukary or the prokaryotes. Okay, so our SAR group is considered to be monophyletic because of genomic studies. So they've got some kind of genetic similarity is how we can kind of write that down. So they've got genetic similarity. And uh, it forms a huge and extremely diverse group. So they're really just super diverse. And they'll have kind of three clades, the stramenopella, the alveolata, and the rhizaria, which we'll just briefly touch on. Right? So stramenopiles include diatoms and brown algae. So again, these are going to be some examples. We'll have loads of examples for this section. Diatoms are some of my absolute favorite things on the planet. You know, other than, they're just so cool. So these are unicellular algae that are one of the most important photosynthetic organisms on Earth. They actually have a, a cell wall that's kind of glass, like it's made of silica, the same thing that makes up glass. So they're essentially these little glass figurines that live in freshwater and marine environments. They're microscopic glass structures that photosynthesize. Like, look how beautiful that is. And if you Google them, they're just, they're beautiful. Okay. We also have brown algae, and these are large and complex. They owe their characteristic brownish color to some pigments and, and their chloroplasts. They're mostly marine, and they really include a good example here, too, is kelp, um, which we find at the seafloor and can reach 60 meters in length. It's actually not a plant. It is, in fact, an, uh, an algae or a part of the protist group. Okay, so this is an example of some kelp. We also have some water molds in this part of things. So water molds are these kind of heterotrophic unicellular stramenopiles, and they typically decompose plants and animals and live in freshwater habitats. So another good example here. Okay. So you'll see them kind of decomposing some things. Not really with living. Okay. Another one that we have are the dinoflagellates, and they're part of our alveolates. Uh, these include some autotrophs, heterotrophs, mixotrophs, and they're common in marine and freshwater plankton. Uh, these guys are actually what we find these blooms of. So these population explosions of autotrophic dinoflagellates that sometimes warm coastal waters um, make them kind of pinkish or orange, and that's what we call red tide. So red tide is due to a protist. Okay. So these guys are another example worth noting. Tons of examples here. Here's red tide again. So you can see what it kind of does is when we get, really it's basically runoff, and I'm not showing it very well, but it's runoff of like nitrogen rich stuff. So basically um, fertilizers and stuff like that, when they run off and make it into the ocean, it provides them with the nutrients they don't normally have, and they just grow like crazy. Okay. Alveolata also include these things called ciliates, uh, which are these unicellular protists, including heterotrophs, mixotropes. They actually have cilia to help sweep food into their, their mouths. So a really, really good example here is paramecium. Uh, this is one of the biggest examples um, used for everything. People always like to watch paramecium. It's really studied a lot. So he's a protist, and he's part of the SAR group. Okay, so here's kind of what it looks like. It uses its little fine little hairs to shovel food in there. Isn't that cute? You're so cute. <laughs> Last of this kind of SAR group is Rhizaria. Uh, and they're, they're what's called foraminiferans and radiolarians. So again, some other examples um, that, you know, we need need to know. One of another really, really important example is called an amoeba. Uh, and you see these guys, they look kind of like splat, they look like a, a nucleus. Okay. They move by what we call pseudopodia. So pseudo is false or fake, and pod is feet. 
So every time it kind of like moves out a little bit, it's sort of like a false fake foot. It just pushes its cytoplasm so it can kind of almost like walk. So they call it a pseudopodia by the way that that works. Foraminiferans are found in the oceans and fresh water. They have porous shells, which foramen is actually like pore opening. So they're porous shells. They're, they have that. They're called tests and they're composed of calcium carbonate. They also have pseudopodia that function in feeding and locomotion. So our, our pseudopods are false feet guys are here. So you can sort of see its porous shell and it would have like a little false foot come out and shovel food in there. That's a foraminiferin, which is also really beautiful though. Almost like celestial in the way it looks. Okay. Radiolarians are the last one. They're also kind of made of uh, silica, so they're kind of these glass structures that are uh, marine. It's really about all that. So that's, again, another example of the SAR group. And these guys look like this. They're just nuts. It looks like weaponry. All right. So a little connection before we take a break. Their fossil fuels uh, are the organic remains of organisms that lived hundreds of millions of years ago. So diatoms are thought to be the main source of oil, and coal was uh, formed from primitive plants. So these diatoms actually are what are helping us fuel today. So it's pretty cool. Um, just some information about, let's say, lipid droplets. Basically, we're trying to get them as a renewable source of energy. Um, if we could get that, we could process and harvest them as a biodiesel. But there's a lot of technical hurdles to do this on an industrial scale. So there is a possibility here. Just, you know, it's, it's going to take some work. Okay. All right, this is probably a good place to take a break because we've made it through the SAR group. So I would advise that you take a break, pause the video, chunk your notes, write some questions, and then come on back. So this is our second overall group. So this is group two. It's not very clear here, but we had SAR group as one. Our second group are the excavata. And these guys have been recently proposed as a clade on the basis of their molecular and morphological similarity. So basically just like what they look like. Okay. So the name refers to the fact that they have this kind of excavated feeding groove uh, that is possessed by some members of the group. So excavates have modified mitochondria that lack a functional electron transport chain. So if you remember back, if you think back to this, whenever we had, um, you know, the cellular respiration. So we had cellular respiration. At the end, we have that electron transport chain. That's where we generated a crap ton of ATP. Well, these guys can't generate that ATP using that oxygen. So we don't, we don't have the oxygen there, so they use an anaerobic pathway like glycolysis to actually extract energy. So, not quite working the same way. So, a couple of things here, and we'll just add on to this one, but excavates include a whole bunch of things, including the termite, em termite endosymbionts. So termites eat wood. They cannot break down the wood by themselves, so they actually require a protist to be able to break that down. So that's one of them. Like, as an example, well, let's see. Uh, excavates also include some autotrophic species, and they also include some mixotrophs like euglena. Okay. So um, we'd have to look back at it, but it does include those. There we go. Euglena. That makes a trail. Uh, excavates, oops, excuse me, common waterborne parasites, so Giardia intestinalis, which is a... Um, you, drew, you get that from drinking bad water, so I, I think I caught Giardia. Um, uh, it wasn't, there was a couple that I caught Giardia in Mexico once. Okay. So that's a, an intestinal parasite. I didn't get things forward, it just worked its way out. It was not, it was not fun at all. Uh, the parasite Trichomonas vaginalis, which causes 5 million new infections each year, of human reproductive tracts. Um, 
it causes a it's called trichomoniasis so that's a um, an STI that's caused by this particular parasite it's a protist okay let's see that yeah, it kind of looks like that it's a weird looking guy all right and finally we have trypanosoma which actually causes sleeping sickness in humans so we can take a look at that so it's this guy you see the blood cells it's not very big but he's in and amongst the blood cells and it causes this kind of infection usually more in Africa than here all right our third group so this is our third overall group of protists are the unicons or uniconta and so this is kind of a controversial grouping because they include these guys called amoebozoans and this is a um, a group that includes kind of animals and fungi, um, which we look at a little bit later, but honestly, when we talk about it, animals are going to be more closely related to fungi. We typically think of fungi as more like plant-type things, but they're actually more closely related to animals. So when we say we have uniconts as animals and fungi, it should make sense that they're kind of simplistic versions of both animals and fungi. So amoebozoans have lobe-shaped pseudopodia, so once again we have those false feet. And they include some free-living amoebas, some parasitic amoebas, and some slime molds. Okay, so a whole separate group of amoebas here. All right, so here's some kind of a little, little guy. Here's some doing an endosymbiont thing. It's going to eat it. So plasmodial slime molds are common where we have moist, decaying organic matter. So they consist of this single multinucleate, so it actually has several nuclei, a um, massive cytoplasm, undivided by plasma membrane, so it's called a plasmodium. So it's a plasmodial slime mold. So you'll just kind of see one kind of big grouping, and there'll be multiple nuclei throughout. That's what makes it plasmodial. So here's an example, and we could look at a slime mold. They have that great video, if I, if I forget to play it, Google it, because they have a slime mold solving a maze. It's oh, so cool. Cellular slime molds are also a part of this group, and they're common on rotting logs and decaying organic matter. They usually exist as these solitary amoeboid cells, so they kind of exist by themselves. But when food is scarce, uh, amoeboid cells can actually swarm together and get this kind of like slug-like aggregate. So they can actually join forces if necessary. So a little like social almost behavior between these guys. So it's like very, very simplistic social things. Like, man, we're, we're all having a hard time here trying to find food, so they all stick together. And they'll form a stock supporting an, um, an asexual reproductive structure and actually produce spores. So you can kind of see the mass here together, and then they can produce the stock with spores up top. Which we'll talk about spores more. That's, that stuff's coming up as we get towards plants. All right, all the members, so this is our last group. So this is our fourth category here, fourth super group. These are called Archaeplastida. So these guys are all auto, <coughs> autotrophic. They'll include red algae, green algae, and some kind of land plant kind of relatives. Okay. So red algae, as our example here, are mostly multicellular. They contribute to the structure of coral reefs and are actually commercially valuable. So red algae are more of like our coral reef type things. Notice just because it says algae doesn't mean that they're exactly the same. They can be different. We had an algae in the SAR group, and we have an algae here in the, <clears throat> in the Archaeplastida group. Uh, green algae may be unicellular, colonial, or multicellular. So there's a lot of variety here, again, with the example of green algae. So we have Volvox, which is a colonial green algae, and then you have Chlamydomonas, which is a unicellular algae that's propelled by two flagella. So a couple more examples of what those guys would look like. So here's Volvox kind of living together, and then Chlamydomonas, which, you know, lives by itself and has its two flagella, which help move it around. 
Okay. Um, so an example, we have Olva, it's a sea lettuce, and it's a multicellular green algae with a complex life cycle that includes an alternation of generations. It consists of a multicellular diploid form and a sporophyte form, um, or which is called sporophyte, and then a multicellular haploid, which we call a gametophyte. Okay, the last, we got a little bit left here, but really I want to show you alternation of generations because it's going to be really, really important as we move to plants. So this shows the connection between protists and plants in this way because plants do this. Some fungi do as well, uh, but we don't see it in animals. Like at all. Okay. So what happens is that we'll, we'll have one single spore here. And what happens is the spores will undergo mitosis. These spores are 1N or haploid. And so when they make exact copies and make a whole large plant, that whole plant will be made of cells that are also haploid. Okay. So we go 1N to 1N through mitosis. Okay. Then at some point, it'll produce single gametes. So we have a male gametophyte and a female gametophyte. So both of these are separate sexes based on those cells. They'll kind of leave out gametes. They'll produce those, which gamete means gamete and phyte means plant. So this is a gamete producing plant. So it produces gametes, which then gametes do what gametes do. They'll add together. So we have fusion of gametes. So 1N plus 1N is our 2N, their fusion of gametes. And we have a zygote. Okay, that should be, that shouldn't be new, okay. Then what happens is our zygote kind of undergoes mitosis like we know before, so our zygote's 2N, and undergoes mitosis um, with all the cells of this plant producing a 2N. So it produces a plant that's made completely of diploid cells, okay. Those diploid cells at some point will undergo meiosis, which remember meiosis goes from 2N to 1N. That's the only way that works. Okay. It will half the genetic material, and then we get spores that are 1N through that. And again, it's called a sporophyte, spore-producing plant. So it produces those haploid spores through meiosis. Okay, so that kind of is a really quick way to put it is that we start off with 1N spores, they'll undergo mitosis to create male and female gametophytes, gamete producing plants. Those gametes are then made, they're 1N each. They will at some point in the right conditions fuse together, making a 2N zygote. The 2N zygote will undergo mitosis to make a whole plant that is a spore producing plant, produces those spores through the meiosis, the whole thing starts over again. A lot of terms, a lot of things to know there. So if you don't quite have it, that's cool. We're going to talk about it again with plants, but at least I wanted to give you an idea of a starting point there. Yep, we can get rid of that. All right, so the origin of eukaryotic cells led to the evolutionary radiation of new forms of life. So unicellular protists are much more diverse in form than simpler prokaryotes. So we've got a lot of diversity here. Multicellular organisms like seaweeds and plants, animals, and most fungi are fundamentally different from unicellular organisms. All of life's activities occur within a single cell in unicellular organisms, but in multicellular we have these kind of specialized cells that perform different functions and are interdependent. They all require that all the cells work together, not just within one single cell. Multicellular organisms have evolved from three different lineages, from the brown algae of the stramatopiles, from the kind of fungi and animal-like unicons, and the red and green algae of archaeplastids. So these three different places, we get some different types of organisms. Okay. And so you can kind of see it here. So we've got our algae that have led to some different types of plants. We've got red algae and all these guys and land plants that happen to mark back to an archaeplastid common ancestor. Uh, unicons are kind of diverging out to where we get all whole kinds of new things, and including fungi and animals off these lineages. So they had a unicont-like um, protist ancestor. 
One hypothesis states that two separate Unicot lineages led to fungi and animal which diverged about a billion years ago. A combination of morphological and molecular evidence suggests that coanoflagellates, which are the closest living protist relative to animals. So that's one of those things. And you can see that. I think I have a picture of that. Oh, it's the coolest thing. So animals, we'll talk about it, but a sponge is an animal and it has these little collar cells. Well, it turns out that coanoflagellates, when they sort of live together, have a cell that looks really similar. So it gives this idea that these guys are protists and these are animals, but it suggests that these are very closely related because they're sort of looking the same way, sort of doing the same stuff. So it's really interesting, really, really cool. All right, we managed to get through that one pretty quickly, so that way you could take a look at it. But if you have any questions or if it moved too fast, shoot me an email. Let's work our way through it and make sure that we got it for for the next part is our exam.